So Ephesians 5 and verse 22. Now, this is probably going to be a two-part uh, message from this chapter. We'll, I think, overlap this chapter and the next little section again next time. But I'd like to start by thinking this morning about, uh, about home life. You know, the toughest place to be genuine is at home, in your own home, isn't it? It's been said that we are who we really are when no one is looking. And it's not often that we're in places where no one is looking. But, you know, home life is almost that place, isn't it? It's that place where we can, we can just kind of be ourselves. If you can't be yourself at home, then where can you uh, really be yourself? And, and so being yourself there at home, it reveals what we are really like. You know, in the workplace or maybe university or in school or some other sphere you know a person can be can be patient can be generous might be kind-hearted uh, and so on but out of sight and behind the scenes that same person can sometimes be uh, short-tempered uh, can be uh, possessive maybe argumentative uh, cruel even uh, all mother uh, all other manner of things we could uh, uh, throw in there. Well, clearly, it shouldn't be that way. There shouldn't be a dichotomy between who we are in private and who we are in public, what we are uh, within our own, our own homes, what we're like there uh, versus what we're like outside. Now, that's not to say that family life doesn't have uh, its difficulties and its tests. You know, if there's, if there's any place in which we're likely to face the, the toughest of challenges, it's in those things that are thrown up in life that we have to deal with uh, in, and navigate through in home life. Um, uh, rather than, you know, we might have pressure jobs where we've got circumstances and difficult things to get through, but I suspect that the things that we still find the hardest is navigating um, close relationships and <laughs> so on and the situations that we might face uh, as a result of that. And we know, don't we, we just recognize that home isn't all sweetness and light, as they say. It's not all uh, roses and uh, petals and things like that. You know, home um, where we have the, the closest of human relationships uh, is the place where uh, perhaps rough edges can grate against another person. And uh, whilst home is where we can do the, the most good, it, it can also be the place where we might do the most harm to or the most hurt to another person. And so it's the matter of uh, home and relationships in the home that Paul now turns to in this next section, chapter 5, verses 22, all the way down to chapter 6 and verse 9. He addresses uh, wives first in verses 22 to 24 and then just picks it up in summary again in verse 33. He addresses husbands in verses 25 all the way down to verse 33. Then children and fathers, verses 1 through 4 of chapter 6. And finally, servants and masters, chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. And uh, he, he picks up on all those groups because all of those people would typically make up a first century home in Ephesus. We might lack the uh, servants and masters bit in our own homes. I think you wish that you had some servants there at home. And if you did, uh, there's some instructions for how to uh, manage them uh, here in this passage. We'll come to that another time. But before we get into the detail of this section, we should remember that the teaching here should not be divorced from what has come before. Who is Paul writing to? He is, he is writing to the saints and faithful in Christ Jesus in, a, there in Ephesus. He's writing to the saints who he is described as have, who have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. He's writing to people that are saved and, and forgiven, who are now indwelt by God's Holy Spirit, uh, chapter 1 uh, down through to verse 14. He, he's speaking to those who have been raised up in Christ to newness of life, who, whose life was 
characterized by death and being dead in transgressions and sins, but now raised up to new life in Christ. He's speaking to those who he's described as, as having been saved by God's grace. We've been chosen and called and saved just surely because God wants to show his mercy and his goodness to us and, and saved to do the good that God intends to accomplish through each of us. Chapter 2 and verse 10. Chapter 2 and verse 10, uh, I often find myself coming back to and realize it's, it's a much more important verse than, than perhaps I first realized. For we are his workmanship. God is at working in us and he is making us to be who we now are, the new creatures, new creations in Christ, created in Christ Jesus for good works, for, for a purpose, for, for, for the good which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, that we should, we should do this good, that we should live in this manner, that we should accomplish um, what it is that he is calling us to do. And so as a result of all that, as we, uh, chapter four speaks about growing to maturity, to his, his glory in the church and using our gifts to that end. Uh, that's ch sorry, chapter, uh, uh, yes, yeah, cha that is chapter four. But at the beginning of chapter four, he, he turns from, uh, from a, speaking and, and telling us about what we have in Christ to, to now, as a result of that, what our walk in Christ should be like. We're to walk worthy of that calling, to live in accord with it, chapter four and verse one. And that means, unlike our, our former manner of life, verse 17, no longer walk in this way as the rest of the Gentiles walk, as you, as you formulate, we're no longer to walk in that way. Instead, we're to walk like God's dear children, chapter five and verse one. That's what we're called to live like, to pattern ourselves after him, not the world and the old ways, to put that off and put on our new nature created in Christ Jesus. And ultimately that means if we're going to walk in this way, uh, we are to live with, with all humility, gentleness, long suffering, bearing with one another in love, chapter four and verse two. And we've seen a number of these other uh, walk uh, commands, uh, you know, those kind of three key verbs in, in um, Ephesians is sit, walk, stand. Uh, and we're going to come to that stand and withstand in due time. But having raised us up and seated us with Christ in the heavenlies, we're now to walk in this manner, live in this manner, walking in love, chapter five, verses one to seven, walking in the light, chapter 5, verses 8 to 14, walking in wisdom, chapter 5, verses 15 to 17, and walking in the Spirit, chapter 5, verses 18 to 21. And these instructions that he's about to come to, addressing husbands and wives and children and parents and masters, servants and masters and so on, they, they can't be divorced from what he's already said. They, they don't stand alone. They don't stand separate in some way from what he said. No, all of these, all of these things um, that he's about to go on, they, they are built upon the foundation that he's already laid out here. So Paul addresses these four main parties, wives, husbands, children, and servants. And to each of them, there is one primary instruction. So if you forget everything else this morning, just kind of try and think about who you are or who you might be at one point in life, and what that key instruction is for you. That is the what, if you like. He gives uh, an accompanying reason why and an example how for, for these circumstances and these people here. And as we just kind of observe this, uh, the instruction to, to wives is actually quite sh short and relatively simple. It's just, uh, verses 22 through to 24, and then a reminder in verse 33 is just three verses there. Whereas uh, us men, we might notice that his instruction to husbands is the longest here in this section. That's because we're slow to, to listen. That's because we need to be told and, and repeated. And no, I'm not teasing, pulling your leg there. But no, that's because actually in God's economy, the husband in the circumstances he's addressing here, bears the greatest responsibility as the head, 
of his wife and family. And so because of that, we need the most instruction. And uh, because maturity, we've seen from verses uh, chapter 4, verse 2 onwards, is demonstrated by humility and harmony and unity and service in love. He's talked about that. If you, as you're growing to maturity, this is what it's going to, to look like. There's going to be humility, being submissive one to another. There's going to be harmony. Uh, maturity, the, the, the maturity church isn't fighting at loggerheads with each other. So we should anticipate that the mature marriage relationship isn't going to be fighting at loggerheads with each other. It's going to be in harmony and have unity. And there's going to be a spirit of service there. If that's what maturity in the church looks like, it's going to likely look that way in home life as well. And that's why those similar things are applied here in home life. If it wasn't so, then our homes would be characterized by all the works of the flesh, by, by pride and stubborn self-will and disharmony and divisions and so on, selfishness and unreasonable demands. And if, if, that's, what, uh, if that's what our homes were like, well, that would be a, a terrible thing, wouldn't it? So we hate, need to kind of hold that bigger context of, of what it means to be a mature Christian as we think through what it means for me in my relationships here that our walk in Christ should always remain in mind here. Well, let's turn firstly then to his instructions to wives, firstly to wives in verses 22 to 24. And the main instruction uh, given to those who are a wife is this, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. This is the what to do. If we were to ask ourselves, what we must do, the main ex exhortation is to submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, a, a wife is, is only a wife because she is married and has a husband. This isn't an instruction to all women to be all submissive to all men in all spheres of life. It doesn't say that noticeably, does it? It talks about those who are wives of their husband. It is given to a Christian wife. That's who he's writing to here in relation to her own husband and her own family. It's not about wives being submissive to somebody else's husband or something like that. That's not to say that we should be argumentative with someone else's husband just because it's not your own husband, but you, you get the, the sense of who he is writing to here. We know, don't we, that in Christ, everyone is equal before God. There's neither male nor female, Jew, Gentile, bond, slave, free. You know, there's no difference there in our standing before God. But we do not all have the same roles. And so once we become a wife or a husband, or as we are born into this world as a child, we fulfill a role for a certain length of time in our life whilst that role continues. And it is that role as husbands and wives and children and servants and so on that he is addressing here. Now, the King James Version, the old King James and the NIV helpfully phrases the verb here as submit yourselves. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. And that's helpful because there is this middle mood within the verb itself. You can get active, which is something you do to something else. You can get middle, which is an action you do to yourself. And you can get passive, which is to be something. So here in the middle, this is an, act, an action you do to yourself. It's an imperative, which means it is a command to do, but the middle mood conveys an action you do upon yourself. Now, to all of us in the lead up to this section, verse 21, just before this section gets going, verse 21, notice it says, submitting to one another, 
in the fear of God. He's, he's spoken to all the church family there to have a spirit of humility and submission in all their relationships. But he, and this is a characteristic of the spiritual life in that context. This is the spiritual person who's going to be patient and kind and humble and gentle and loving and wise and thus mature. And so he is calling upon wives here to have that uh, attitude of submitting, of submission towards uh, their husbands here. Now, note, it is not for husbands here to command or demand that their wives obey. It doesn't say, you husbands, command that your wives should obey. And it doesn't say that. It's addressed to wives, and it's an appeal to them. Have this attitude in mind that submission is what God calls you to do. It is a, it is a choice of the wife. It is this, this middle mood gives a sense of it being a self-imposed decision to submit to her own husband as to the Lord, to be willing to yield to him. And so he says, just as you uh, just as you would normally submit to the Lord, wives, submit your own husband as to the Lord, just as you would submit to the Lord, to the Lord's will, to the, to the direction that the Lord would give you, so do towards your own husbands. Well, why should a wife submit to her husband? Have we got an answer to that? As, as I think we have in context in the big situation here, with uh, again can be reminded that it is to promote harmony and unity and peace which are all fruits of the spirit at work in relationships but there's more to it than that especially paul picks up on uh, this reason verse 23 for the husband is the head of the wife as also christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body paul says that there is an order within creation and that everyone has a head. I mean, we all have a head on, on our body, don't we? And he shows that that head is the one who looks over and leads, looks over the needs of the body and leads the body. How many creatures do you know that are two-headed? A two-headed creature is... A monster, isn't it? Um, notwithstanding, these some things sometimes occur in nature, but it, we, we recognize that there's something wrong there. And so every wife is, is appealed to, to simply recognize that her husband is the head that God has appointed over her and be willing to yield to him. For he says here, the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. Now, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul puts it around this other way. He says, for the head of the wife is her husband, and the head of the husband is Christ. And he even goes on to say, and the head of Christ is God, i.e. the Father. And we know that uh, the Son, while equal with God by nature... You know, if we were to think through the attributes of who the son is, we're not going to come up with any different attributes than who he is in relation to the father. He shares the same nature as God the father. But the son willingly, didn't he, willingly submitted to do the will of the father. Thus, as it were, um, manifesting his sonship and, and God the Father's fathership, his headship. And so there's a reflection within marriage of the very Godhead, and uh, not least, and the church, as we shall see. If we think about why in society uh, we might see so, so many troubles uh, in relation to this, it's, it's because of sin, isn't it? It's because of sin, which, which kind of promotes and stokes and advances self-will, that we, we can all somehow um, be, be king and master of our own uh, lives and determination and so on. It's that first lie from the garden, you shall be as gods, but sin kind of promotes and advances that, doesn't it? So that this order is distorted or abused in this world. You know, it's not to be abused, this headship 
row, is it? And so we see, don't we, all manner of disorder and division within the world and within relationships. But that, we're being told here, should not be the case within the Christian home and the Christian marriage and family relationship. He's telling us that there are lines of authority and responsibility which God has established. And they reflect God's order and are therefore our, our ultimate good. And that this principle of headship is there for our good. And so for the Christian, our concern is that this good, good order should be reflected in our homes because the husband is in God's design, the head of his wife, he is the one who has responsibility and accountability. He has responsibility for his wife. He has accountability to Christ or to God for his actions. He has accountability to him because Christ is head over him and his wife, isn't he? Christ is the one to whom every husband is to yield and to look to with respect for guidance and leadership too. So the wife is being called to do here what the husband is also being called to do as he yields to God's will and under the headship of Christ himself. If we think about that role of headship here, uh, Paul says Christ took upon himself the responsibility as head to be the savior of the body. That's the church in verse 23. Now that's not something that husbands can do for their wives exactly. Husbands can't be the savior of the wife. But what he's just reminding us there is Christ as head did everything that he could for the salvation of the church. He acted for the good of the church. And so the husband as head should act for the good of his wife. It's a little Kind of example here. It demonstrated Christ's loving responsibility towards the church, which he gave himself for. And so uh, with all these things in mind, it should be, it, it, it's only right to appeal to a wife to submit, to yield her will to her husband, to recognize his headship uh, over, uh, over her. Paul says to Christians, Christian wives in answer to how, that just as the church looks up to its head Christ and lives for him and yields to him and the good he intends, so a wife should submit to, to her head, namely her husband in everything. Verse 24, therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. But husbands, this doesn't mean that you can be commanding or demanding or cruel or lazy or selfish or sinful or any such thing. That's not what headship is about. Headship, as he's shown there by the example of Christ, is about, it's about doing good. It's about working for the salvation of, it's working for the blessing of. Uh, our headship is, is simple. Uh, if, if we to, to boil it down to one thing, why, why would a wife be called to submit to the headship of, of her husband? It is to give him the opportunity to respond, to be the head that, that God has ordered him to be. That he has that responsibility to be head. If the wife is constantly fighting against that and usurping that authority, then she's not being who God has called her to be, and he can't be who God has called him to be either. And so if, we, if, if family relationships are going to have the maturity of harmony and humility and goodwill and so on, and be worked out within the home for the blessing and benefit of all, this is the pattern uh, of authority, he says, is the way uh, to bring that about. Well, with that in mind, let's turn to husbands here, which is the longest set, longer section, verses 25 to 32. And the main instruction, the what for us is husbands, love your wives. It's there in verse 25 and repeated again in verse 28 and again in verse 33. With, we're, we're slow, 
we need to be reminded three times of the same thing because we don't often get it the first time. Again, note, husbands, we're not told to command our wives to obey or to demand or, or that they should serve us or any other selfish thing. In fact, quite the opposite. We're commanded to love our wives. And the Greek word for love here, you might imagine, is that strongest word for love, agape. You've come across that before. It's, the, it's not just a friendship love. It's not the erotic love uh, or romantic love. It's the sacrificial love. It's the love that would give itself for another. Indeed, we, the love we are to have for our wives is to reflect the love that Christ has for his church. Husbands, love your wives after this manner, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it or for her. And so, husbands, you are told and and appeal to to love your wife and give yourself for her. It's the kind of love that calls us to lay down our life for another, which doesn't have demands for itself, but gives and desires what is best for the other. And so uh, speaking to us men, you know, this is what it means to be the head and husband of our wives. Is to, is to love them with an everlasting love, a sacrificial love, a love that is willing to, to lay down your own life for the protection and for the provision and for the perfection uh, of your, your wife and for her blessing and good. And, you know, that is a remarkably high calling for us to fulfill. It's a very great challenge, isn't it, if we were to think about that? as it works its way out in practical life. It's something we're likely to fall short of. It's something that, that, that we probably will never manifest in the, in the way that we should do, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have this in front of us as the reminder, the constant reminder of the character of love that we should have for our wives. Now wives note, in this passage, it doesn't say it's for you to comment on how short your husband comes in this sacrificial love as he tries to be head. No, you pray for him and be submissive to him, thus giving him opportunity to lead as head and to be that loving head as he should be. And you husbands, it doesn't say here that it's for you to comment on how submissive or not your wife may be to you either. No, if you by loving action show your self-sacrifice in your relationship to her, then I'm sure that she will learn that her own best interests are at heart, in your heart, and that it is only right to be or to hold that attitude of, of submission and being willing to yield. Well, why? Why should, why should we love our wives, we might ask, us men? It seems in some respects a strange thing to challenge us over. But I think we just have to remember the context in which it was first written was a society where, where marriage didn't typically happen because of romantic dating and love, marriage typically happened in the first century, certainly amongst believers and uh, uh, amongst the society like that, uh, uh, certainly amongst Jewish families, which many of the church members uh, came to be from. It was a, an arranged marriage, wasn't it? Um, and, you know, those arranged marriages don't often start with romantic love at the heart of them, do they? So for a husband who the family has arranged to be joined to his wife, what if there's going to be harmony there in that home? If they're going to grow to maturity, then, then she's called to be submissive and he's called to love. And as he loves, he's going to nurture and develop that relationship from one of duty to one of devotion. 
I think one of my favorite films is, um, not that we sit and watch it very often, but I do like to watch it uh, at times. It's probably because it's so long that I don't watch it very often, but it's the film Fiddler on the Roof. And uh, there's just a lovely scene. If we, if we were doing, if today's meeting was at home, I could call up the, the, the bit on my computer. I've extracted the lovely moment when Teve, who's been married to Golda for, 25 odd years. They're, they're a Jewish family, kind of peasants growing up in, in Ukraine. They've got uh, been blessed with five daughters, otherwise they're living in poverty. And, um, and all the daughters are going off and romantically getting engaged with other people and they're having to deal with all this change of tradition. And uh, there's this touching moment when uh, Teve and his wife Golda sing a little song together. And he asks her, do you love me, you see? And she, she kind of, what do you mean do I love you? It's been 25 years I've, you know, washed your clothes and fed your things and I've changed the beds and we've had all these children. And, you know, what are you doing asking me, do you love me? Well, do you love me, he says. You know, they, they reflect back on that moment when they very first met. I didn't know you and you didn't know me and I was so anxious and you were so, uh, so troubled by it all and so on. But... Uh, but he wants to know after 25 years, do you love me? Well, it's kind of wrong way around. He should be saying, I, you know, but, but they come to that, that, uh, that wonderful moment. Yeah, I guess I suppose that I love you. And yes, I suppose that I love you too. It's a lovely little, little moment. If you haven't seen it, you'll have to watch the film and, and catch it. But of course, there is that, that growth and maturity and development in the relationship. And they've come to love one another genuinely. And, it's a wonderful little thing to be reminded of. Love shouldn't all be there at the beginning and fade as the relationship goes on. You know, there's a danger of that in our Western society, isn't it? And to, to found our relationships upon this kind of fluffy pink romantic love and it not be strong enough to sustain us through the hardships that, that are going to come. We've been reminded here that love uh, like faith has to grow, doesn't it? And uh, so for us in our time, there's this clear reminder by its repetition here to love our wives, to love our wives, verse 28, to love our, our own wives, verse 33. This is something that we need to keep the flame alight and to stir up and to cause to continue to grow uh, with our eyes upon the knees of our wives and, and not ourselves. Do you love your wife? It's a straightforward question for us husbands, isn't it? But why secondly, and more importantly, should we love our wives? We have the example here of Christ himself who loved the church. And here we have the reason and motivation behind Christ's sacrificial love. He gave himself for the church. This is verse 25. You love your wife just as Christ would love the church. In this matter, he gave himself for it or for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. If we were to look back in our past, we, we must remember and understand that every member of Christ's church was once impure was once defiled by sin, was once dead in transgressions and sins, as he said in chapter 2 and verse 2. But Christ, in his great love for us, laid down his life for the church, didn't he? He became a sacrifice for her, for, for this intent, to this goal, that he might cleanse her from within, from the a defilement of sin and that he might continue that process in life by applying the truths of God's word to finally present the church holy and without blemish and as a radiant bride verses 26 and 27 here and uh, that bride will one day be perfected for the glorious future when she will be united 
to the Lord himself in the coming world. And so he says, similarly then, husbands are to love their wives, bearing this, this good, this good that they should do for them and this good intention God has for them in mind. And this brings us to the how. Just as Christ also loved the church for the good of the church, so we are to love our wives for the good of our wives. And just as we might care and provide for our own bodies, so when we love our wives, he says we are in effect only loving ourselves. How can we assert this? Well, Paul quotes, doesn't he, from the passage in Genesis. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Right back in the beginning, when God joined husband and wife together, Adam and Eve, that very first time, he said that they, if you remember, Eve was taken from man and then joined back to man, and they became that one flesh, that one unit. And he says, if we are one flesh united together in marriage in the Lord, as we love and care and nurture our wives, we are in the end only taking care of ourselves. If we, are, if we are hateful and hurtful to our wives, well, we're only in the end shooting ourselves in our foot. We're only in the end going to hate and hurt ourselves. And of course, we do so sadly see that when marriage does sadly break down. But this is not to be so in the Christian home, is Paul's appeal. No, the Christian husband is to, is to nourish and to cherish his wife. For in so doing, we simply nourish and cherish ourselves because we're one flesh, one, we're one unit. And so we husbands, we have to ask ourselves, do you love your wife enough to die for her? Ask it of myself too. Do you love your wife enough? to die for her, this is the high calling God has upon us as husbands. And you wives, really, the question is, do you love your husband enough to live for him? Because that's the same picture there, isn't it? Well, in explaining all this, Paul indicates the marriage is what it is because of something deeper and something much more profound that marriage isn't just a ceremony or a certificate that confers some kind of legality upon a couple. No, in the plan and purposes of God, the sacrificial love of Christ for his church and the unity that we have together in him, joined in him, is reflected in this world in the bond and in the unity of marriage. That marriage is to be a primary relationship it is to be a permanent relationship. Why? Because Christ's love for his church is primary and it is permanent and it will continue. And so of all places then, the Christian home and marriage is to, is to mirror this, isn't it? To be a picture of Christ and his church in this world. Well, as we read all this, you know, I'm conscious that we come to a passage like this with our own personal situation. Some of us may have been married happily for a long time and, and there's, that's Lord willing going to continue. Others may be just starting out in that marriage journey. Well, we need this instruction and help for us, don't we? Some of you may be married to an unsaved husband or wife and perhaps not in such a happy situation. Some of us may have experienced a breakdown in marriage. And there was a time when you were married and, and now you are not. Some uh, might be young and single and hoping that marriage is ahead of you. Others may be hoping not that marriage is ahead of you or you don't know if it's going to be for you. But you know, whether our marriages are an outpost of heaven on earth or not, they're only ever at best going to be a partial a reflection of the precious and permanent relationship that Christ has with his church, of which you, if you are a believer, 
are an eternal part. Yes, marriage in this life is intended to be a blessing for all, for the individuals in particular, for the blessing of raising a godly family, for the blessing of society, and so on. For some, it proves to be so. For others, it can prove to be a very difficult journey. Well, as he concludes, if you, if you don't get this whole uh, marriage and the church picture thing that he just reminds us of, the net, nevertheless, you know, let each one of you in particular so love his wife as himself and let the wife see she respects her husband. You hold on to that. We're to, we're to work to try to make those relationships work because this is God's will for us, isn't it? But most of all, we're to know that being in Christ, we are precious in his sight, that he is at work within us, whether we are married or not, whether we are single or not. God is at work within us. He has called us to be his people, hasn't he? He has saved us, chosen us, called us, saved us that we might be and become that precious and pure and radiant bride of Christ in the world to come. All of us in Christ are going to be presented faultless, blameless before his throne with exceeding joy on that last day. And it all comes down to grace, doesn't it? You know, our, our marriages uh, aren't always going to be the happiest experiences in life. If they are, feel wonderful. And we need to, to, to work for that to, be con to continue. But the ultimate perfection is seen in the relationship between Christ and his church. The ultimate perfection is going to come when he comes, isn't it? The ultimate perfection that's going to be experienced is, is when we are finally joined all together with him at his return. But for now, it's down to grace that God chose you and me in Christ. He gave himself for us upon the cross that we might be holy and blameless before him in love for all eternity. And so whatever our circumstances you know the greater marriage of all God's people is something that we are all a part of isn't it we are loved despite our faults and failures and weaknesses and shortcomings we are loved with an everlasting love in Christ a love that is stronger than death isn't it as demonstrated through Christ's own life and death and resurrection. Why did he do all that? Well, it was that he might give himself for the church. Well, we're going to uh, reflect on this again a little bit more, I think, next time and bring our thoughts to the next little section uh, down to verse 9. But with these thoughts in mind, let's just pray together and conclude uh, this morning. Father in heaven, uh, we thank you, Lord, for these timely reminders that we need in our own homes and families and relationships, husbands and wives. Uh, loving Father, we pray for your wisdom and help to see how these things might practically be worked out in our daily experiences. Uh, loving Father, we want to thank you that we love, as it were, because you first loved us. And we can love because you've poured out your love into our hearts. Our loving Father, we pray for that growth in grace and humility and harmony and unity, Lord, within our marriages and families. We pray, Father, for those who might be struggling at this time amongst uh, our own church family or our wider uh, family networks. We pray, Father, for their strengthening, for their perseverance, uh, for, Lord, uh, your love and mercy to prevail over them, and that in you, Lord, they might find all that they need. Father, we thank you that the measure of your great love for us is there demonstrated in and through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself to do your will, but ultimately also to save us from our sins. Father, we thank you that you are head over us, 
that there is one to whom we can look who loves and leads and guides and provides and will bring to perfection in your good work and purposeful plans. And so, Father, we commend our way into your hands this day. In Jesus' name, amen.